In this study, we will look at the meaning of the phrase, in the world, but not of the world. This phrase has long been used by Christians in reference to the world around them, but has suffered from much misunderstanding. In fact, the image used on this title slide, depicting the planet Earth as photographed from space, may contribute to the ambiguous misunderstanding of what is intended by our title phrase. The world, as employed twice in the phrase, in the world, but not of the world, may not have reference to the world that we know of as planet Earth. And this in itself reveals the necessity of conducting such a study on the meaning of the phrase, in the world, but not of the world. The awareness of this phrase has been popularized in contemporary Christian circles by this logo. And it's been used on t-shirts and automobile window decals and bumper stickers and elsewhere. N-O-T-W is intended to convey the message not of this world. And with the T in the form of a cross, the one displaying this logo is attempting to reject that he or she is a Christian person. Now I must admit that I've always been leery and wary of what I've termed bumper sticker mentality that attempts to project a reality by a pasted on symbol or phrase. Jesus seems to have indicated that the way to evidence that one is a Christian is by their fruit ye shall know them. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and the godly control of oneself. Galatians 5, 22, 23. And that's just the character of Christ. And that should be the criteria by which a Christian is identified, not by a cryptic message on a decal or sticker. But we must go on to consider the meaning of that phrase, in the world, but not of the world. And since this is a phrase used by Christians, we must look at the New Covenant literature of the New Testament, which was originally written in the Greek language, to observe and evaluate the Greek word that is translated into English as world. The Greek word cosmos had a wide range of meaning amongst those who utilized koine, that is common Greek, in the first century AD. Lacking the scientific observation of cosmological perspectives that have been revealed in recent centuries, the early Greek writers nevertheless used the word cosmos to indicate uh, several different realities. Cosmos was used to refer to the created universe as a whole, the entire natural created order. Looking back at the beginning of all things in the creation as recorded in Genesis, the early Christians believed in the Creator God and the distinction between the Creator God and the created world order. Standing on Mars Hill, in the midst of the Areopagus, Paul referred to, quote, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, Acts 17.24. It is likely that the created order of the universe was usually not conceived of anything beyond the terra firma of the planet Earth that uh, Greek thinkers lived on, although they undoubtedly speculated about those lights in the sky and how they seemed to pass over their position every night. Cosmos was often conceptualized, therefore, as the Earth we live on. That is perhaps what Paul had in mind when he wrote, quote, Since the creation of the world, his, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. Romans 1.20 He may have been referring either to the whole universe or to the planet Earth. And the Apostle John explains that he, Jesus, was in the world, I would say on planet Earth, and the world 
we could say universe or planet Earth, was made through him, and the world of mankind did not know him, John 1.10. Well, that leads us right into the fact that the Greek word cosmos was also used as a comprehensive and collective designation of the world of mankind, referring to the entirety of the human race, as, as they understood it at that time anyway. And that most familiar verse of John 3.16 reads, God so loved the world, I think that's of mankind, that he gave his only begotten son. Son, The limitations of the scope of the world of mankind in first century thinking might be revealed in the despairing comments of the Pharisees when they exclaimed, The whole world of mankind has gone after him, i.e. Jesus. But the overwhelmingly predominant usage of the 187 usages of the word cosmos in the New Testament refer to Satan's world system of evil. After Satan's solicitation of mankind in the Garden of Eden that led to the fall of mankind into sin, Satan was the spirit that worked in the sons of disobedience, Ephesians 2.2, 2. and the whole world of mankind was now operating in Satan's world system of evil. As the Apostle John states, the whole world of mankind lies in the evil one, 1 John 5, 19. Satan is referred to as the ruler of this world. The fallen world of mankind that employs his character of selfishness and sinfulness. And James advises that friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, James 4.4. 4. Now the complete phrase, in the world but not of the world, is not connected like that anywhere in the New Testament. It is actually two phrases found in close proximity in the prayer of Jesus to his Father in John chapter 17, what some people call the real Lord's Prayer. In John 17.11, Jesus prays, and now I will no longer be in the world, but they will be in the world. Jesus had been preparing his disciples for his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, for the fact that his physical presence would be removed. But his presence in the form of the Spirit would provide the comfort and dynamic they needed to continue. So in his prayer, he verbalizes that he will no longer be in the world, but they, his disciples, will be in the world. And the question we must ask is, what concept of the world is he referring to? The preposition in refers to location within something. Would Jesus no longer be in the universe, or in or on the planet Earth, or in the context of mankind, that is, human beings, or in Satan's world system of evil. But he indicates that his disciples or followers will be in the world. And then we ask in the universe, in planet Earth, in the context of hum humankind, or in Satan's world system of evil. What do you think? And then just five verses later, Jesus continues his prayer with these words from John 17, 16. They, his disciples and followers, are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. The preposition of is translated from the Greek preposition ek, which is the preposition of source, origin, or derivation, meaning from or out of. His disciples will not derive from or out of the world, just as he, Jesus, did not derive from or out of the world. But again we ask, was Jesus referring to world as universe, or planet Earth, or collective mankind, or Satan's world system of evil? What do you think? We know that Jesus, the Son of God, derived all that he said and did from, that is, out of, ek, 
the spiritual context and source of his father God for every moment in time for 33 years. He functioned as a derivative man who allowed the Father God to function in and through him, deriving everything ekphaos from out of God. John 14.10 The Father abiding in, in me does his works. It is clear that Jesus did not derive from or out of the source of Satan or his world system of evil. The use of the preposition ek used so often in the New Testament in reference to spiritual derivation would tend to steer the meaning of the phrase of or out of the world toward a denial that he or his followers would be deriving from the spirit source of Satan and, of course, conversely, would be deriving from or out of the spirit source of God the Father. <clears throat> Given the close proximity of these phrases here in John 17, and, and it's self-evident that these phrases are, should be connected in the phrase, in the world but not of the world, the most likely valid interpretation is to maintain a consistency of the meaning of the word world in all of the phrases. And in that case, Jesus and his followers were, or we could say are, in the context of Satan's spiritual, spiritual world of evil and suffering the assaults thereof, but are not intended to spiritually derive from and imbibe in Satan's character and actions of evil, but are to derive character and action from the Spirit of God who was, would soon come to reside within them at Pentecost. So let's continue to provide some illustrative images of how the Greek word cosmos was conceptualized in the New Covenant literature. And, of course, that literature was written in the Greek-speaking world of the first century. So we're going to look back through those words again, noting that cosmos was understood as the universe, the entire world order. Contemporary scientific observations have allowed us to see just how infinite that universe is, with asteroids and planets and galaxies, etc., even back to the functional commencement in what we call the Big Bang. Cosmos was also understood in reference to the planet Earth, i.e. the land on which they lived and we live. And, of course, they had no idea that it was a round sphere in the midst of a vast space as this satellite view pictures it. Cosmos was also understood as the collective of all human beings, the world of mankind, even though they had no idea that there were other people groups on this planet in different continents, etc., but in Christian thought, particularly, the Greek word cosmos was used to refer to Satan's world system of evil as contrasted to God's intended kingdom of righteousness. We will picture this in this elliptical shape with a line that will represent where things take place in this category, i.e. the plane of activity in the world system. Now, the first century Christians recognized the either-or contrast of ontological spiritual beings and powers. They recognized the difference between the spirit of the world and the spirit of God, as Paul differentiates in 1 Corinthians 2.12. They recognized the contrast of spirit sources and spirit kingdoms far more than contemporary Christians recognized that. They realized the contrast of, uh, between the Satan, the ruler of this world, and also the spirit of this world, and that the entire world of mankind lies in the power of the evil one, 1 John 5.19. They believe the Genesis narrative of Satan's solicitation of the original couple, Adam and Eve, via the serpent, and how the disobedience of Adam and Eve led to the fall of mankind into a sinful state 
whereby the entire world of mankind fell into world, Satan's world system of evil, and fallen mankind was enslaved and held captive under the power of the evil one. The character of the evil one, Satan, also known as the devil, the adversary, the enemy of God, is antithetical to the character of God. His is the character of selfishness, sinfulness, deception, rejection, lies, and destruction that leads to death and murder. Is it any wonder that the world we live in is as it is today? The world system of evil operates in a closed system of necessity that denigrates and disintegrates the created dignity of mankind. Human beings are shut up in sin, caught up in the bondage of Satan with the false hope of freedom, unable to understand their situation as their minds have been blinded to their own plight. Now, now what we are describing is not an outmoded superstitious explanation of a bygone culture but is the only legitimate cosmological explanation of the realities of the fallen world order. Christians need to have their eyes opened to what's going on spiritually. The elementary principles of the world that Paul talks about in Colossians 2.8 are enforced, enforced by rulers and authorities of the dominion of darkness, and they're at work in this world system. I quote from Ephesians 6.12, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Do we, do we really believe what we're up against? And how does this morass of the of the world system of e evil function. Well, I'm going to try to illustrate that by de depicting it with a power pyramid, which could just as well have been called a, a kingdom pyramid or a hierarchical pyramid. <clears throat> and the selfish desire of fallen man is to climb up to the top of the pile, using some people, rejecting other people, in order to achieve a particular position. You see, the world is constantly playing king of the mountain. But no sooner does one group build a power pyramid than another is constructed to counter the first tower of power. And these two groups of people then engage in battle against one another to assert their particular perspective. When you were in school, did you ever take a course in sociology? For you see, the predominant sociological theory to explain the social interactions of human peoples throughout history is what is termed the conflict theory. The underlying premise is that the natural selfishness of mankind leads them into conflict with those who think differently, act differently, or have something to protect from others. And so it is that wars and rumors of wars seems to be the best explanation of human social interactions. Personal conflicts and collective battles dominate human history from Cain and Abel onward. And some of the areas wherein this conflict is waged are between nations, in the realm of politics, between economic theories, ideological differences, and most certainly in the context of religion. Nations encro encroach upon other sovereign nations, sometimes in the aggression of seizing territory, sometimes in the theft of sensitive digital information, and sometimes in outright military conquest. Politicians are always at each other's throat. Republicans versus Democrats, various segments within each party battling for supremacy. 
The global economic theories of socialism versus capitalism are always sparring with each other, seeking to implement their systems in various situations. The ideological camps of conservatism versus liberalism, left versus right, moralism versus libertarianism, pro-life versus pro-choice, the bantering and arguing never ends. And religion is just another one of the world's battlegrounds. Christianity versus world religions, Protestantism versus Catholicism, Calvinism versus Arminianism, fundamentalism versus liberalism, evangelicalism versus cultism, premillennialism versus postmillennialism, always trying to convince others that they represent God's side of the conflict. Selfish, fallen human beings always find something to fight about. There is constant sectarianism and divisiveness in their attempts to control and dominate others. They build bigger and bigger hierarchical pyramids of power, evaluating their success by statistical numbers and sphere of influence. They fine-tune their techniques of sophisticated manipulation and media misinformation. To maintain their positions of power, those at the top of the pyramids always want to give the impression that progress is being made toward the betterment of the group that they control, the illusion of social security. And such power struggles are endemic to the world system. Why? Because Lucifer, who became Satan, started it all off with a power struggle, a revolt of selfish rebellion against God. I will be like the Most High God, and his character pervades the entire world system. <clears throat> Continuing then to use the same diagram of the world system of evil, we now proceed to consider the important historical singularity wherein the conflict dynamics of the world were addressed. In the midst of all the selfish human power contests, the ultimate and infinite power of the sovereign, almighty, and omnipotent God was historically interjected into the situation. Notice that this is illustrated with an inverted triangle anchored in an entirely different plane of existence in the heavenly places. And that's intended to signify that God's power is totally opposite of the world's sense of power, for his is the power of grace and love, not self-seeking power. <clears throat> so in the fullness of time, as Paul says in Galatians 4.4, God intervened and invested himself in human space-time history in the incarnation of his Son, the God-man Jesus the Christ. Now this intersection of God with man, the event by which all history is measured, was God's self-revelation of himself. Jesus was an anomaly in the world of fallen man. He declared... I am not of this world. The ruler of this world has nothing in me. To Pilate he explained, My kingdom is not of this world, and if it were, then my followers would be fighting. Even though all authority or power had been given to him in heaven and earth, Matthew twenty-eight eighteen, he refused to engage in the petty power plays of the world around him. He was not an empire builder. He wasn't even a religion builder. He would not take sides with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or the Zealots. He would not engage in the political issues that dominated Roman and Jewish interest. They came to him saying, should we pay taxes? And he said, give unto Caesar. What is Caesar's? Now when he spoke, he would often draw crowds. But when they realized that he was not going to conform to their socio-political and religious expectations of a militaristic messianic deliverer, 
those crowds would disperse and depart. And he never clamored after them to beg them to come back. Numbers of followers were not his concern. Everything Jesus did was counterintuitive, counterculture, cultural, and considered even counterproductive to the world around him. And the power brokers of the world system could not stand the radical difference between Jesus and themselves. He had to be done away with. So they were gathered together against Jesus. Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and peoples of Israel, this one who exposed their hypocrisy and would not conform to their social dynamics would have to be destroyed. So the rulers of this world crucified the Lord of glory. Convicted by a kangaroo court, he was executed on a Roman cross. And the world powers thought that they had eliminated another one of their recurring problems but they played right into the hands of God's divine plan. They didn't take his life. He deliberately and voluntarily laid down his life for mankind. He was obedient unto death, even death on a cross. From eternity past, God had intended to pay the price for man's sin by the death of his own son in order to redeem and restore mankind to relationship with himself. The one having the power of death could not hold the sinless one Jesus in his power. And God raised Jesus up in resurrection. Ephesians chapter 1, 19-21 He, God, raised him, Jesus, from the dead and seated him at his right hand far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. God in Christ defeated all the power plays of the world. And from the cross, Jesus exclaimed, It's finished. The mission is accomplished. Prior to that, Jesus had told his disciples, I have overcome the world. The ruler of this world has been judged. Jesus told his disciples, The evil one who usurped the loyalty of mankind, Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public display of them and triumphed over them. Colossians 2.15 He rendered powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. For the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Now Jesus also said, on the basis of his resurrection, I came that you might have life, and have it more abundantly. Jesus did not do what he did in order to establish another system for man to engage in and attempt to control, whether that be religious, political, or whatever. No. He did what he did to take the death consequences of our sin in order to make his life available to all receptive, faithful individuals who might therefore represent his life and presence in the world. So with that historical reality in mind, how do we, as Christians, living in the present time, fit into this diagrammatic picture? When we receive the Spirit of the living Christ into our spirit, Romans 8, 9, and are turned from the dominion of Satan to the dominion of God in Christ, Acts 26, 18, rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved Son, Colossians 1, 13, we experience Christ as our life. And we then stand where the historical Jesus stood on the plane of the fallen world, 
participating in the crucified, resurrected life of Jesus, because the risen Lord Jesus, the experiential Christ, has become the life-giving spirit that now lives in us as our life. It is the privilege of every Christian to stand there in the focal point of God's grace with the privilege of living out the cross life with the counterintuitive understanding that the way to live is to die. It is there that we have the privilege to represent the life of Jesus on earth in our person. And we may be only the only Christ expression that some people will ever see. <clears throat> yes, we are in the world, but not of the world. Like Jesus, we are an anomaly to the world. We live with our feet on the ground in this evil world system, but we are not to adopt or adapt to or get sucked into the vortex of the world's ways of nationalism and politics and racialism and e economics, ideologies, religion, etc. And that, my friends, is not an easy task. It requires constant spiritual discernment and an obedience that's willing to listen to the Spirit and be led of the Spirit. No man can serve two masters. We must fix our eyes on Jesus. We can say with Paul, the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. But that does not mean that the satanic world system is not a powerful force assaulting our senses every day. It simply means that because of the historical work of Jesus in his death and resurrection, and the ongoing work of Jesus in our lives by the Spirit, we are not owned by the diabolic world and do not have to succumb to and submit and serve the ways of the world. The world and its powers have no right to control us any longer because we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are free to live counterculturally, to live the Christ life spontaneously, without constraints of conformity, free to be and do whatever the living Lord Jesus wants to be and do in us. It was for freedom that Christ set us free, Paul explained to the Galatian Christians, chapter 5, verse 1. So who is the one that overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. But believing in Jesus is not merely mental assent and affirmation to the historicity or theology of Jesus. Believing is receiving. Faithful receptivity of the activity of the life and character of Jesus Christ in our lives in every moment of every day. And thus we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us more than conquerors over the world's pressures as well as the inner, patterned, selfish tendencies of our fleshly desires. Paul goes on to say, I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We do not have to do this in our own power of self-effort. The battle is the Lord's. And that's what David declared when he confronted the giant, Goliath. And it's true in our Christian lives as well. He, God, will bring it to pass, Paul explained. And that's why he could exclaim, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The living Lord Jesus is the conqueror the victor, the overcomer in and through us. My grace is sufficient for you, the living Lord told Paul when he was confronting hardship in his life. The power of Christ dwells in us, and when we are weak, we are then strong in his strength to continue to live in this world. Now, we do not want to imply that the Christian life in the world but not of the world, 
that we'll be living a life of utopian victory with the provision of God's grace. The world around us does not appreciate the anomaly that we present as Christians any more than they appreciated the radical nonconformity of the life of the historical Jesus. That's why Jesus explained to his disciples, in this world you will have tribulation. And he said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And you will be hated for my name. And the Apostle Peter later wrote, Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, that which, that which comes among you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. James even wrote, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Jesus Christ has defeated the ruler of this world, and ours is the victory in Christ Jesus. But between the cross of Christ at Calvary, where the victory was won over Satan, and the second coming of Christ, when Christ comes again in victory, we Christians live in what I call the enigma of the interim. Knowing that the victory has been won, but awaiting with hope the consummation of the victory in the future heavenly realm. And it's difficult for Christians not to get discouraged at what's happening in the world around them. The world power forces seem to amass ever greater power and influence. Some Christians develop a defensive siege mentality, an us-versus-them perspective. They get caught up in identifying alleged conspiracies of what they think subversive forces are conspiring to do in the nations and in politics and in economics, in the mind games of ideology and in religion. And much of this can be wasted time, attention, and energy. And I've seen Christian groups get all agitated about various conspiracies of uh, anti-Christian agendas and genetically modified foods and terror groups, etc. But I think God's words to Isaiah are pertinent. You are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy. And you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. Isaiah 8.12 now, that's not to say that there are not conspiratorial activities in the world. But Christians are not to get caught up in fear of them. We should be cautious of jumping on the bandwagons of various causes and movements in the world. They often just lead to the secularization of Christianity. And we end up playing the world's games and employing the world's methods of propaganda, boycotts, etc. See, the Christian stands in the world as an anomaly, a square peg in a round hole. We don't fit. We are the odd man out. We are strangers and aliens in, in Satan's world system. And yet ambassadors of God in a foreign territory. We see what the world powers are proposing when are never going to resolve and solve the problems of mankind. And so we reject their false solutions and artificial options, their proposed social programs that serve only to prop up their own positions. And in that sense, our attitudes as Christians should be subversive to the world's ways. We demythologize, desacralize, and demystify the world's idolatrous obsession with money, science, productivity, progress, and superiority. We can even laugh at the world's proposals and solutions. We recognize that the world's going to do what the world's going to do and it's not up to us to try to change it. I think, for example, of 9-11, uh, when the planes flew into the World Trade Towers in New York, or recent Supreme Court decisions, 
And I just, at, when those happen, I just say the world's going to do what the world's going to do. You see, the world cannot be saved because the satanic rule, ruler of the world system is irredeemable. He is the fixed evil adversary of God. In fact, we should be able to even recognize that there are no Christian solutions to the world's self-perceived problems. And that's especially true if we were to try to integrate Christianity with government or political solutions. Now, there's no preset Christian agenda for all the world's ills. The spirit, like the wind, blows where it wills. And God works uniquely and novelly in every situation as he wills. And we always recognize that with God, nothing is impossible. As Christians, we're not called to do something productive for Jesus while we're here on earth. We are called primarily to be who we are in Christ. To bloom where we're planted, so to speak. The will of God is Jesus manifesting his character uniquely and spontaneously in our behavior in whatever situations we find ourselves, and that to the glory of God. You see, the Christian's presence in the world, but not deriving from the world, presents an anomaly of contradiction that the fallen world resents. At the same time, it presents the Christian with a dialectical choice of how to respond to, world, to Satan's world system in which they live. Is the Christian individual to disengage as much as possible from the world around them? Or is the Christian individual to engage the world in which he lives and declare by word and action why he's different from the world system because he derives his character and action from a contrasting spiritual source from God in Christ by the Holy Spirit? And so we want to go on to point out that both of these options, to disengage or to engage with the world, are both biblical. We will begin by talking about disengagement from the world, from Satan's world system of evil. And this can certainly be attested from Scripture. We read here in James 4.4, 4, Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. 1 John 2.15-17, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. And then from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. We are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them, and walk among them, and I will be their God, and their, they will be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. I will welcome you. This passage, by the way, in, in 2 Corinthians 6, is in the context of conflict with religionists. But as we've already indicated, religion seems to be viewed as part of the world system in so much of Scripture. So what is clear is that Christians are not intended to succumb to or participate in the ways of the world, in the self-oriented power plays, in the statistical evaluation of success, in the building of personal empires. Rather, as strangers and aliens in the world, Christians are to function with a totally different modus operandi, with a counterintuitive character of God's love. On the other hand, we see scriptural calls for engagement with the world. 
Matthew 5, you are the salt of the earth, and if we lose our saltiness, we provide no divine flavor or preservation of humanity in the context of the world. The next verse, Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. And 5.16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Yes, Christians are to have an impact on the world around them. Jesus selected his twelve disciples and said, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. And he went on to say, Don't worry about how or what you're going to say. For we will be given, we, that will be given to you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. They were intended to derive their character and activity, even their words, from the Spirit of God at work in them. Just prior to his ascension into heaven, Jesus said to his disciples, When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses even to the remotest part of the world. That's a commission for all Christians. But we, keep, we should keep in mind that the, the Greek word for witness was marture, from which we get the English word martyr, implying that our witness will be an investiture of our very lives that may not be well received by the world and may even lead to death. And looking back again to Jesus' prayer in John 17, that's where we started this study, Jesus prayed to the Father saying, I have sent them, i.e. his disciples and followers, into the world, that the world may believe that you sent me. Every Christian is a sent one, sent to share the only good news, the gospel, of God's grace in His Son, Jesus Christ, whereby all men have been redeemed by the death of the Savior and can be restored to humanity as God intended by the presence of the divine life within their spirit. So Christians are called on to engage the world around them. And we've been given the spiritual provision of the divine dynamic of God's grace and life in order to do so. Paul tells us that we, as Christians, have the mind of Christ. That, based on the fact that we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may know the things freely given to us by God. We should be able to discern and evaluate the world's ways, which are so contrary to God's ways, and thereby able to challenge and expose the premises and solutions that the world proposes and offers for the alleged betterment of mankind. Christians should be able to see through what the pseudo-saviors of politics and the power brokers of society are proposing and explain that their programs will never work as the solution to mankind's problems. At the same time, Christians are obliged to engage the world by expressing Christ's compassion for the plight of fallen mankind, recognizing that they are slaves of sin, held captive by the devil to do his will. We should feel the loving compassion to represent the life and ministry of Jesus Christ through us by helping to alleviate the human misery of abuse, disease, hunger, war, etc., and to engage in whatever actions might help to restrain the corruption, perversion, and destruction of the world's inhumane actions. So the Christian's relationship with the world in which he resides, Satan's world system of evil, forms a both-and dialectic of disengagement and engagement. And once again, each Christian will have to listen to the living Lord Jesus within them in order to obediently ascertain how Jesus Christ in them wants to minister through them in the context of the world where they find themselves. We should not make formulaic techniques concerning how any Christian should respond. There is a scriptural call to disengagement. Recognizing that the children of God and the children of the devil 
are obviously antithetical one to the other, and we are not to compromise with the world. Christians are citizens of heaven, participants in God's heavenly kingdom, and exist as strangers and aliens, aliens, an ostracized minority in Satan's world kingdom. We are not to love the world nor the things of the world. In fact, friendship with the world is regarded to be hostility toward God because there is a definite either-or dichotomy between God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. At the same time, there is a scriptural call for Christians to engage with the diabolic world of evil. Jesus explained to the Father in prayer that he had sent his disciples into the world that the fallen world of mankind might believe that he was indeed the Savior of mankind and receive the divine life of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit into their spirit in order to be restored to humanity as God created human beings to be. Jesus explained that his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, was like leaven that permeates into the loaf into which it's mixed. Christians are to allow the character of Christ to permeate and pervade the world in which they live, subtly, even surreptitiously, demonstrating the counterintuitive power of God. We Christians are engaged in a conflict, the struggle against the world forces of evil against the spiritual forces of wickedness. And it is incumbent upon us not to go and hide in our stained glass caves, not to develop a ghetto mentality whereby we attempt to escape, withdraw, or isolate ourselves from the world around us. As with any dialectic of thought, the overemphasis of one tenet to the diminishment, neglect, or denial of the other will lead to an aberration or even heretical position. The pacifism of a detached separation from the world that attempts to be otherworldly often has a tendency to become so spiritually minded that they have no earthly good. We do not want to become a marginalized subculture of non-resistant Christians huddled in our spiritual bomb shelters, coming out only to hurl judgmental invectives against the surrounding world. An overemphasis on disengagement can lead to a denial of the incarnational involvement of Jesus Christ in the world. On the other hand, an extremist aberration can occur when the call to engagement is overemphasized to the denial of disengagement. A form of Christian activism can result that seeks to challenge and confront the world system. And Christians view themselves as combatants, warriors, crusaders, who are soldiers of the cross, attempting to win the war against the world. And what they seldom realize is they played right into the hand of the world by engaging in the warring conflict of the power plays of the power blocks of those kingdom pyramids. Antagonistic attempts to engage in fighting so-called culture wars in order to convert the prevailing culture into an alleged Christian culture along with orchestrated attempts to Christianize our society and build a Christian nation, they're all self-defeating. The world cannot be saved because Satan is irredeemable. The Christian faith cannot be imposed by coercion. The Christian faith involves a freely chosen faith-love relationship between a receptive individual and the triune God of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And only God in Christ by the Spirit can draw a person to himself via a divine revelation. Wherein each individual Christian can be available to be the vessel in which the living Christ is manifested in the world, but not of the world. Now I do want to give credit where credit is due. 
The writings of the 20th century French sociologist Jacques Ellul have greatly influenced and affected my thinking about both the dialectic formatting of Christian thought and about the Christian's relationship with the world. And this undoubtedly comes through in what I've taught. The entire corpus of Elul's writings seems to deal with what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. And he constructs this in a masterful dialectic of thought from one volume to another throughout his writings. Jacques Ellul wrote, I believe, 58 books in his native French language, and more than 30 of those volumes have been translated into English. And I have listed here six of those titles that I have found particularly interesting and enlightening. The Presence of the Kingdom, which was his first book soon after World War II, Later, he wrote another book called The False Presence of the Kingdom. A most interesting book, The Subversion of Christianity. That was the first of his books that I would ever read. The Ethics of Freedom, Living Faith, Prayer, and the Modern Man. And those are just representative of the volumes that he's written. Now, I, I must say that the blame or credit for the illustrative diagrams that I've used in this study are not to be attributed, attributed to Jacques Ellul. Um, they are merely my t attempts to create a visualization of what many people seem to find quite abstract when they deal with sociology. And I do hope that uh, they will prove helpful to those who see and hear this study. I do hope that they will lend some understanding to, to what it means to be in the world but not of the world. This narrated slideshow video was scripted and presented by Jim Fowler, Director of Christ in You Ministries. And if you're interested in any additional studies, whether they be textual, audio, or visual, you can go to the website at www.christinyou.net.